Well, good afternoon and good evening to some of the people that are connecting with us today. My name is Carla Montalvo and I am the coordinator of the Roots and Shoots Groups in Puerto Rico. Thanks for being with us today. We are celebrating, we are celebrating the World Swift Day. So we welcome you all from all over the, all over the world. We have here uh, people from Chile, Venezuela, Renata that is from Brazil and Spain and England. So we welcome you all. It's nice to have you here today celebrating the Swift Day with us. So today we have a very special guest. Her name is Ren Renata Biancalana. She's from Brazil. She's a PhD candidate student. So she's gonna be talking to us about the, the amazing uh, Swift world. So <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> pass to Renata so she can start her presentation. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Carla. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here for the second year and also to be part of the this day, the World Swift Day. And for the, thank you, I'm very thankful for your invitation for this talk. I'm gonna try to give a very like a, sh a short talk about human impacts and conservation of Swifts worldwide, not only in the Americas. Um, as Carla said, I'm going to introduce a little bit of myself. Like I'm, I've been studying Swifts for 10 years, uh, since 2010, and I'm, when I started my uh, undergraduate, and my whole academic life has been based on studying Swifts in Brazil. Today, I am a PhD candidate in zoology at the Universidade Federal do Pará and Museu Paranaense Emilio Guilherme in Brazil, and I'm a visiting researcher at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia in the US. Also working with SWIFTS, but now working with molecular phylogeny and working with evolution. Um, so I might say some things that might look basic for people that already study SWIFTS or that have more contact with them, but I'm gonna start from the basics. So SWIFTS, they belong to the order SWIFTS and other represent, representatives from other three family, other two families, they belong to the order Apodiformes. These three families, so have family Apodidae, which are the swifts and swiftlets. We have the Emiprocnidae, which are the tree swifts that are the closest relatives. And also we have the hummingbirds that are restricted to the Americas, for example. Just uh, the tree swifts, they are restricted to Southeast Asia and swifts are distributed globally, as we're gonna see. Um, so, as I said, they are distributed globally, uh, with most species concentrated in the tropics, in the tropical region, but we also have species in extreme latitudes, like from in the Andes and Alaska, Siberia, Lapland, and fin Finland and Sweden, up to Tasmania, so they occur in a wide variety of habitats from uh, desertic like, altitude, like how, uh, high altitudes, like from 12,000 feet like 4,000 meters high up to like deserts and uh, tropical islands in the Pacific. So they are, have a very wide distribution. Um, we, today we have around 105 species. And when I say it's around, be it's because we, it's a very complicated family in terms of separating species. So the, we have a lot of species considered cryptic so they many like individuals or populations from the, the same species they might look look alike and they, you might think that they are they have like geographic variations but in the end when we go and have a like make a deeper analysis like uh, genetic analysis we can see that they are actually different species um swifts in general then they are the main feature is very obvious so they have very long wings compared to their body size, to the body length. They also have something that nobody pays a lot of attention, but they have special adaptations in, the, in their feet. So they, unlike other birds, they can't perch on uh, horizontal surfaces. So they can't perch on branches or on like, for example, energy cables. They do can't perch only vertically or cling to vertical surfaces or to foliage and some specific types of like vertical substrate. They also, some species, they have um, some adaptations in the, on the tail feathers. 
uh, also known as like spiny tail, uh, spiny tail swifts or spine uh, or needle tail swifts, because they have like prolongment of the of the tail feathers, the, the base. Um, most species they don't exhibit sexual dimorphism, so it, which means that males and females they look alike, and they are also not very colorful like their relatives, the hummingbirds. So they often range the color from black to city brown and gray with different details in orange or chestnut around the collar or white markings in the face, on the throat, on the, on the belly, and so on. Whoops. Um, one question that I often um, hear, especially from people that, like from those that are not biologists or have anything to do, not really related to, to birds or conservation generals, like why are they important? Why, why do you conserve a species? Why do you um, give any special attention to that species? So one in interesting topic that I've been in more recently interested in working with is uh, ecosystem services. And here I'm gonna bring just three um, that I, Consider relevant ecosystem services that SWIFTS provide for us. So ecosystem services are usually services provided by animals or like the, by the preservation of a specific area or trees or nature in general. And there's a retribution, there's a service that's provided by these animals. So pollinization, um, air filtration or um, control of pests are gonna, as we're going to see. So swifts, they are avid insect consumers. So they only feed on insects, which means that they also only feed when they're flying. So they are constantly flying, as you can see here in the red arrows. They are constantly chasing their prey items. When they are flying, they have very long wings. So, but these wings, they are also very maneuverable, so they can like have a lot of speed and also glide in the sky and when they're feeding on insects, like especially on swarms of insects, like during summer, during the summer. Most species, they, when they are, so they are foraging, they are eating this uh, insects, they swallow them or they can also when it's time or uh, the breeding the breeding season they can keep this insects like uh, um like they make a compact ball of insects with their saliva and they store they, they keep that ball inside their mouth or in the esophagus to feed to the nestlings and therefore like they are very relevant in terms that they contribute to the control of agricultural pests. So in many areas where they occur, we also have other um, inse insectivore birds or bats that occur in the same, the same sites. A second feature that's economically the, but relevant is that at least one species and at least one genus of swift, that's the Aerodramus, as we can, we can see here, that is Aerodramus pacificus, or this, the name is self-explanatory, edible nest swiftlet, is a, is a species that is relevant and economically important. And why is that? So this species, it's a tiny swift, and it occurs in Southeast Asia, specifically in Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Philippines, and the nests that this species uh, builds, they, they are all made of saliva. So they are very white, as you can see here on this picture with the, with the eggs. And usually these swiftlets, they nest in large colonies, right? So they, they usually nest in caves. Nests are harvested, they are collected in natural cavities, but they are also today uh, investing a lot into swiftlet farming. As we can see here, this is like inside of a, as, as they call it, like, it's like, like a building 
that is constructed as built without windows and just with some hollows and entrances where the birds can go inside and they, where they are attracted. And they start like um, building the nests inside this structure. The nests are harvested and they are they go through a process of cleaning and of like um, molding, shaping, and finally they are sold in the uh, Asian market for like very high price. So as you can see here, for example, 227 grams of this uh, box with uh, swiftlet, swiftlet's nests can cost up to like $500, $539 or even more because there are also several uh, types of grading of the quality of the nests. And it's a market that's relevant. It, it moves around $5 billion per year, especially, um, and this is considered like a delicacy in Chinese, um, in, in Chinese um, markets. Another important service that's another, uh, that this time we can't really put a price on, like in the agricultural, like in the control of, of insects, for example, that we could eventually press, uh, like put a price and uh, a value, uh, like a monetary value to that service and also for the harvesting of nests. But this time we, we can't really, it's like something intangible. This is the sense of belonging in, in time and space. So in South America, in other countries where you have seasons, so like so well defined you usually we we don't we don't see that but in a way we we know like birds that don't occur like during the whole year there they eventually appear they show up during spring and we know that's spring because a specific bird is there in our backyard or is, we can see them like daily so it's the same thing for swifts so in many places like for example here in, in north america we have on the two coasts, like in the west coast, we have the Vox Swift, and in the east coast, we have the Chimney Swift. They appear during spring, so now they are everywhere, and they are going to nest in old chimneys, in school chimneys, in house chimneys. So there is an interaction, an interaction with humans. So they fall. Sometimes the nests fall, and we have to uh, do some kind of rehabilitation as it happened like I, I, I in Brazil I helped rehabilitating um, nestlings that um, eventually were found in the bottom of um, grill barbecue grills like this that are made of bricks so there in South America it's warm we don't usually have like fireplaces we have um, barbecue grills so usually that's where our chimneys with the relative species that we have there this is where they are found. Also, like for example, in Europe, and I'm gonna tell say the case specific case of Israel, but in Europe, it's very common for people to have um, swift uh, swift nest boxes in their houses. So what we can see here in this picture is like several nest boxes. So one, two, so six nest nest boxes. Uh, when you see the white, this little white uh, hole is the actually an entrance of the exterior so the bird goes inside usually this uh what we are seeing on the the inside of the next box next box sorry is covered but people there they can put like video cameras inside and the birds they they don't seem to bother so there is a connection between people and the birds during a specific time of the year because they are not there for a long time, but while they are there, people are feeling connected. And in Israel is very interesting, the uh, celebration of welcoming Swifts. There's a ceremony for welcoming Swifts from their migration. So uh, at least like two or three species that occur in Israel are migratory. So they go usually to South Af Southern Africa to during winter, and they go back to Israel during spring and summer. So they just many, many fledged nestlings just fledged as we speak this week. But they have a nest nest in the Western Wall. They have this um, tree of hope that was built specifically with swift, swift, uh, like symbolizing peace in, like in this turbulent, turbulent area. 
So sleeps in a way they connect people from any religion, any um, country, any form of belief, any economic uh, condition. Like you have people that they are, they connect a lot of people and they give us a sense of belonging. So when, when I say like different species, they need, they have different ecological needs and characteristics is that I hear a lot of students that work with swifts or they're starting to work with swifts and kind, kind of put everything in the same bag and it's not the way it works. Different, we have like different species from South America. They form different, they, they have different uh, behavior and many of them are, considered like resident and they are, or they are sedentary, they don't migrate at all. Other species, they like the common swift in Europe, it moves from, so it's migratory, it goes from Sweden up to Congo and they have different life strategies. But one thing that they do have in common, like most swift species is that the best period to study them is during the breeding season because that's when they are finally in the nest. So they are sitting there, their nests. And finally you can see them without looking up in the sky and seeing a black dot flying around. So we can collect data about um, nestlings, about eggs, about parasites, about behavior, and so many other different aspects of their lives. This um, swifts, they also have some specific and very rare uh, ecological characteristics, especially related to nest site fidelity. So unlike most birds, they do return to the same nest over and over again during several years. And what has positive and also negative sides, because once a uh, nest site is impacted, probably that colony is going to be extinguished. So we can see that in cases like here in North America for the black swift or even in Brazil where I work with different species like the nest, nest site is disturbed, they, they, they will go away. And pro probably like they have so specific nest requirements that they probably won't be able to reproduce in a year or eventually that colony can be extinguished. They also have low reproductive rate, which means that they raise one, like some species have more than one nestling per reproductive season, but we have a large number of swifts that only have one single nestling or two nestlings per season, and the season can take up to almost six months. So like for short, like small birds around like, 40 grams, 60 grams, larger ones that are like around 100, 120 grams. And this is a lot. This is almost like, um, they are many times compared to seabirds also because of this very long and reproductive seasons and low reproductive rates. So it's a strategy that has benefits, but also has um, several, consequences. And swifts, they also, are, they have a really long lifespan. So they can, we have birds in literature that were banded and recovered more than 10 years later. So other birds that were recovered like 20 years later. So they're considered like to be long, long lived. So they, we, we can, and we can check that, for example, when we band ring them, using metal bands or geolocators and several other types of devices. Um, a question that I also hear a lot is like, why uh, do, do swifts benefit from human activities? Like what, like if, um, because most species in the world are suffering any, some kind of impact with, with, as our development goes around and progress gets to smaller cities or more rural areas. And in fact, yes, we do have many swift species that benefit from human activities, but mostly it's like in a short time. It's not really a long time, a long time benefit. Um, because um, there is a decline, severe decline in our insectivores, not only birds, but also bats in our worldwide. It's um, swiftly, 
they are um, one inside this category of threatened birds that can have like uh, we have different factors that are impacting this aero insectivore species and that many of them might not be reversible. So in North America, there are some initiatives, for example, to establish um, or try to understand the main factors that are impacting the aero insectivore, especially birds, right? So we have like um, from habitat loss of expand, urban expansion up to degradation, use of pesticides, climate change. So in many regions you're getting like, it's becoming warmer. And we can see in the South, like in, in Brazil, we having, we're having more severe um, droughts and or more severe climate uh, extremes that we didn't have in the past. Also, the appearance of some certain types of diseases, for example, especially in bats. So there's this um, a syndrome called white nose syndrome caused by a fungus that's impacting our insectivore bats in North America. So, and also placement of, though they are considered positive, so like would be clean energy, the wind turbines, but also they have a high impact on not only on swifts and bats, but also in other um, other birds. <coughs> Sorry. When we talk about threats, we talk about um, threats that are caused by human, that are human, and also caused by like natural threats. <coughs> Sorry, just one minute, please. I'm sorry. I have to raise something. So we have natural threats caused by, for example, by natural fires. So many regions, especially savanna-like regions, fires, natural fires are important because some species of uh, plants can only germinate, can only um, um, be grown when there is a cer certain temperature to break them, right? So natural fire is considered something that's po not positive, but it's something that's expected. In many species, they, they are already, uh, they, ev they evolve and they adapt to this situation. So we have species that are in areas where you have called like natural threats, like fires. <coughs> We have at least one species that occurs in Papua New Guinea that is uh, considered it's one, in one of the cate categories that I'm gonna show from my UCN, considered under threat because of volcanic, volcanic activities. We also can have like flash floods. So um, there are some certain species that nest near waterfalls in South America, in Central America, in the Caribbean, here in North America, in, in even in Indonesia. And eventually the nests are around like big boulders, big blocks of rocks or in small caves or wet caves. And you have like start raining in a, another part of a mountain and the river, the volume of water just starts like getting higher and faster and then just vanishes and takes everything away. So that's something that's common. Example. And also, like two in like conditions that occur, and I added Puerto Rico here because they were really something that was impressive. So two hurricanes, like we have this, we have hurricanes and also typhoons that can impact islands. So we can see Puerto Rico here in this the Hurricane Maria, 2017, if I'm not mistaken, that vanished many of this smaller islands here, Hispaniola to the US, and also earthquakes. So these are all natural threats. We, can, we don't have actually control, but in a certain way, many of them are being like enhanced, occurring more frequently and more violently because of climate change. Um, when we talk about conservation and we start to establish a connection between like the natural threats, they cannot, they are there 
and we don't actually have control over, over them, over many of them, we can mitigate them and we can prepare if, we're, if we live in a zone, in a place where it's expected to have like a seismic activity, like Mexico, like Chile, like, um, like in California or like in the Pacific is expected to have this kind of activity, then you have like preparations. But when we talk about um, conservation status and what's related to human threats that I'm, what I'm gonna explain, then it's more complicated. So we have one international organization called IUCN, this International Union, Cons Union for Conservation of Nature, if I'm not mistaken. And they have nine categories of, not of, of threat, but of um, different categories of risk, increased risk or assessment that they do for all types of organisms from fungus to vertebrates to plants. And they can put them in these different categories according to the, for example, the risk of extinction, which can get like more severe. So here, for example, we have this, this is a Brazilian um, mannequin that's critically endangered. So it's one step ahead of being extinct in the wild. If nothing is, if no actions are, are taken. For SWIFT, I did a fast assessment of this uh, categories and also the risks and species and to, to see, like to also to understand, because sometimes we, we are just working in our uh, little like, community and population in a specific country and we don't know the big picture. And I was really surprised by what I found. So for the IUCN red list, uh, for actually for IUCN, they consider 97 swift species. So that's eight or nine species less, uh, less than from what I assess because I'm also studying doing my PhD on this topic. So like today from what is in literature, they, don't, they are not considering eight species as species. They are considering them as subspecies or other types of categories. So, but from what they consider from this 97, 79 are considered least of least concern. So it means that their populations might be increasing, decreasing or stable, but they have such a broad range or they have such a large population that they are not really in danger yet. And they, but they are not, it doesn't mean that they are not monitored. It means just that they are not really to be concerned as other species. Then we have six species that are considered data deficient because it's difficult to assess because they have very small populations because we don't actually know, um, like they were just recently described or they are, we don't have a lot of data for them. So they are considered data deficient. We have five species considered near threatened. So it's one step before really entering into the threshold of being uh, in, 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 a, in a real risk of being endangered. Six species that are considered vulnerable. So they are already in a stage where you can see a decline in populations. So you, like, there are studies that can, um, that are used to base, we, this is, we can see that. And one species considered endangered. And the eight species that are not really available, they didn't consider. From all this, the endangered ones that they, from this um, uh, 17 species, um, 17, no, 18 species that are um, at a certain level of threat, we have oops, six species are located like from the Americas. Um, if I'm not mistaken here, it's uh, three species are from Africa, specific from islands, not really from Africa, mainland, but from islands. Five species are in the region of Asia Pacific. So in like considering um, like the uh, Indo-Malayan um, chain of mountains and also like Papua New Guinea or 
all like Pacific, considering islands and Polynesia and Micronesia and etc. And also three are located in Southeast Asia. So Philippines, uh, Thailand or Indonesia mostly. This is where they are from. And the most threatened genera. So we have eight species from the genus Aerodramus. That's the genus, that's the, the edible nest swiftlet. So we have eight from 23 species of Aerodramus, eight are considered, are, are in threat. So, which means that 25% of the species of this genus are threatened today. Then we have four species of Cypsiloides. That's a genus that's restricted to the Americas. Two species of Ketura that are also restricted to the Americas. Two species of Apis, one in Indo-Malaysia and another one from Africa. And one, um, one from one Hydrocos that a monotypic genus and also one Mirancia that's from the Philippines. So from, from those species that are considered of least concern, we have 42 species that are, populations are considered stable, but also, also being monitored. And five species that are considered, that with the, which the population is considered to be increasing. So the trend is to be increasing and increasing basically because of human uh, interaction. So the first um, species that benefits, for example, from a human, human activity and the introduction of exotic palms, for example, are species that use palms to nest. So we have the Asian and the African palm swifts, we have in, in Asia and Africa, respectively. We also have, for example, the I don't, I'm, I'm not sure, but the Tacornis for uh, Phenicobia, that's the Antil Antillian palm swift, also benefits from palm, like introduced palms. In Brazil, the, the um, neotropical palm swift, the small one, Tacornis spamata, benefits from introduced palm trees and so on. Also, another species that's benefiting, that's considered to be increasing, is the white rump, white rump swift because of the construction and investment in infrastructure in Africa, especially bridges. So this species, as you can see here, this um, blob, this mini tunnel of like made of mud is, is a nest. So it's flying around its nest. So they nest under bridges, for example, and that would be considered like one good reason or one explanation for why the population is considered to be increasing. And also, like we have uh, three more species that are also related to be increasing their population due to association with urban expansion, or especially in Europe. We have one species that's considered to like that the population is unknown, so they don't really they said stated there like IUCN considers it to be of least concern, but doesn't really know about populational trends and 31 species are decreasing. And then when we take a look, deeper look in which species are decreasing and why is, what is the main factor, the main threat is habitat loss caused by agriculture. So agriculture and urbanist expansion. So agriculture in Philippines, agriculture in Indonesia, agriculture in, in Africa, in South America, most places uses a type of agriculture technique to like bring the forest down called slash and burn when they take down the, the forest and burn fire so they can open space, for example, for cattle or for massive like monocultures. And most species that are decreasing are species that I, for example, had contact with during my whole life studying swift. So the sooty swift, the lesser swallowtail swift, the white collared, the white chinned, they are all considered um, to be decreasing, but they are considered also least concerned. 
And one another factor considered like many species of aerodramas, not only of the, the aerodramas specifically, not only the edible uh, nest swiftlet, but other species of swiftlets, they are being threatened because they also have their nests uh, harvested for, for consumption. So not only um, this one that is restricted to Southeast Asia, but also uh, species that occur in the Seychelles, a few species that occurs in Mauritius Island, a species that occur like even other species from a genus called Colocalia, they also nest, have nests being harvested for for consum um, for the Asian market. So it's also considered one big uh, threat, one big um, uh, cause of disturbance in colonies and nest abandonment. The collection, the like the predatory collection and harvesting of nests. Also in South America, like but this time in South America in another situation, but which also um, like I can show you as an example of threat for species that are uh, of least concern, but they're heavily impacted by human activities are the white color swift and also the great dusky swift. Here you can see in both maps, both figures, you have the map of Brazil, of South America, but like in here I have Brazil. The red, the green map, on the left, the green area on the left and the blue area on the right are the range distribution, the range area for the species. And the red dots are established and working operational uh, hydropower plants. And the yellow ones are planned hydropower plants, which means that in the future, they're gonna be more or less like um, in a situation like this. So that's here, this area is called the deforestation arch in the north of Mato Grosso, state of Mato Grosso in Brazil, heavily impacted by the construction of small hydropower plants. So these birds you can see here on the left, they form colonies. So in the smaller picture, every, all these black dots that we can see here, this mass of black dots, they're all swifts. They are great, great dusky swifts. They form colonies of up like to 5,000 individuals or there's one colony here in Adipona that has almost 1 million individuals. And most colonies in this area are already being impacted by hydropower plants. So in the past, this colony had their nests and their like roosting area, their um, social area in this big boulder, this big rock block in the middle of the river. Then um, in, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, like in 2016 or 2017, this same area was impacted. They dynamitized, they exploded part of this rock area to the construct, construction of the hydropower plant in this uh, here on the right are the tur turbines, the the machine like the implementation of turbines and machinery for the hydropower plant. So the all the course of the river was impacted. The level of water, probably nests that were if they had nests here on the left here on this area, these nests were um, abandoned because of the water is no longer there to protect them. This this species specifically is very dependent on water. So this is happening in Brazil right now. Um, regarding the near threatened species, we have five species and two are considered stable and three are considered decreasing, being also habitat loss as the main factor, nest harvesting and also volcanic, volcanic activities. And here I'd like to just like to illustrate that this species here, Cipsalides rothschildi, or Rothschild swift, is, I'm not sure if um, we're gonna have another talk, like around, I think it's at five, we're gonna talk about swifts in Argentina. And this is one of the rarest uh, species of swifts. So it's really difficult to find, although it's occurs in an area that's probably, um, it's easy to access but it's also one species that's very, very rare. We have very little information. 
then in the category that species considered vulnerable, vulnerable, we have six, six of them, three considered stable and three decreasing, including the Seychelles swiftlet. So this is a species that's like a hair from becoming a species considered endangered. We have the American black swift, the Cypsiloides niger from the like that occurs in mostly in the like in the west coast of the U.S. up to Alaska, Colorado, Utah, and also we have the two species of Kitura, Kitura uh, chimney swift that occurs here in the east coast of the U.S. and also at, and, um, Kitura andre or Andre's swift that occurs in Venezuela and it's also considered vulnerable right now due to habitat loss and also climate change. And finally, we also have one species that is that is currently endangered. The only endangered swiftlet, swift so far is a swiftlet. So it's the Mariana swiftlet that originally occurred only in the Mariana Islands, in the island, especially in the island, island of Guam, but has recently been introduced to Hawaii. And this species, what the main problem here is uh, the one one snake called brown, the brown tree snake was introduced by accidentally introduced in Guam and it already has been the main cause of extinction of more than 10 species of birds in the island and also like in the Mariana swiftlet is one of them that's being the, the population is considered to be decreasing and we already have like some papers and uh, scientific reports saying that most most caves where they have swiftlets, they have snakes, and that's where the, the 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 snakes are clearly benefiting, and they're really um, thriving in, in in these places, and probably going to be the cause of extinction of swifts probably in Guam. From the data deficient, we have six species. Also, one of them considered to be decreasing. Three, we don't actually know anything about them, and two are considered to be stable. And we have two species of Cypsiloides in the Americas. So Cypsiloides storii, and that's the white fronted swift, and Cypsiloides cherii, that's the white spotted swift. Both occur, have very restricted areas of uh, distribution, and almost nothing is known about them. Uh, especially Storori that's um, endemic to Mexico, to a region of Guerrero and Michoacan. And yes. And also the not available species that I mentioned in the beginning, they consider uh, geographic variations of subspecies or subspecies. Being Asia Pacific, like the most underrepresented region in this case, and also four other animals that are considered species by some authors and not by others. So it makes it difficult and also has an impact on species conservation because in the moment that you don't assess these populations and you don't know the risks, like if you, if, if you don't put a species in a list of, uh, of, of that has, that has a, some kind of a risk, it, it like a, a, actions that can be taken when you have a species that's considered in, endangered or in risk are much more effective than if you just um, consider them to be a variation of a species that's like least concerned. So it's just basically that's what I would like to, to tell you and to like um, share that these are humans. So we have threats that are in usually these threats today, they are, calls caused by humans, by human activities. So if they benefit in a way from the human activities, but they are also very uh, threatened by this kind of um, activities that are causing populational declines. So especially deforestation in terms of expansion of agriculture and pasture, also energy production in many areas that's just not, uh, that's not shared with the public. Harvesting of nests and of um, like all sorts of um, other animal products, not only um, nests, but in the case of the swifts, nests, nests, 
urban renovation in Europe. So we have uh, buildings that are being renovated and the crevices where they used to make nests are now being uh, renovated and they're being filled. So they don't have anywhere else because the, they don't have the trees where they used to nest in the hollow trees. They don't have those hollow trees anymore. They don't have net like crevices where they nest anymore. So that's also like you, you start like eliminating uh, potential nest sites, tourism and disturbance, the introduction of exotic species, as we saw the this brown tree snakes that's causing the extinction of one species and also the spread of new diseases as we are in the middle of the pandemic and we know exactly what this what that means. And climate change is very relevant today. Very, it's a very uh, new topic, but it's already been can already be seen in affecting many populations around the world. So that was basically what I wanted to share with you. I hope I didn't bore anybody. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions, anything they would like to share, I try my best to help because sometimes it's just I'm overwhelmed with the final the, the the end of my phd but i always try to answer or help anybody that i can and anybody if anybody has doubts they can also email me or access my instagram world swifts and share whatever you want with me so thank you thank you carla again for for the presentation and i will take any questions Thank you, Renata. I mean, it's always a pleasure to hear you speaking about Swiss because I know you're very passionate about them. And yeah. <laughs> just mm -hmm. it's amazing the investigation you do with them um, in the USA. So I'm very grateful that you accept and that you take from your time to be mm -hmm. with us today. So <laughs> I just want to say thank you. And that it was a, that was an amazing presentation. So thank you very much. Thank for that. you. Thank I don't you. Know if, if anyone has a question, uh, you can um, like open your mics. You can open your microphone and you can do the question to, to Renata if you want to. Want to speak? <laughs> Just. Uh, -huh. no. I don't know, uh, Dr. Adrian. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, Carlos, and hello, Renata. It's so nice hearing about the Swiss here again. This is the second time I hear you talking, and I'm impressed with, with all the information you have provided. Congratulations that you're you, almost you. over with your PhD and keep up with yes. the work. <laughs> I, I, I actually, I, 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 I wanted actually, I wanted to go to Puerto Rico when to oh. visit and and to see the the places that I've been studying right now because I'm working with data from the black, for example, the black spits in Puerto Rico. And I'm really amazed by what I'm, what I'm discovering about like the Caribbean uh, diversity, genetic diversity. Diversity, diversity, diversity. I think it's like it's the same populations of like, we think it's the same thing, the white collared swift, the same thing from Mexico to South America, but it's not. The way thing is the same thing, the palm swift, but it's not every island is showing really a, a genetic diversity unique to itself. So I'm very impressed and very amazed. I, I, if I could, I would take a plane and go to Puerto Rico today. Yeah, hopefully if you can come next year. We're going to have the American Ornithological Society meeting in San Juan. So mm -hmm. that would be a great opportunity for you to come and yes. present your work. Yes, I, uh, I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to comment that I think it's, this is a very important and interesting group of birds, but it seems like there are very few experts working with them. So I'm very glad that we got a chance to meet you and hear about <laughs> this, this fantastic work you're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, I know there are very few people, but I very, very, the, I know Miguel is very, works a lot with them. Tom, I think Tom worked with Charles Collins for a long time. He also worked in Venezuela. So I'm happy to see their faces here too. <laughs> Great that we're going to hear about their work too. Thank you, Renata, and take care. 
Thank Bye. you, Dr. Adrian. Bye. Hi, Renata. Hi, Miguel. How are you? I'm fine. How well, are you? I have a question. Uh, I, I was checking the, I, we were working about the next description. We, we start review the family. Of, I, I really don't understand what is the the Kaitura Baus. Um, yeah, that's that's my question. You can a little bit about their the taxonomy um, and the with the Central American populations. You mean I, I couldn't hear because it was it was cutting your when you're talking. Kaitura Vauxi and okay, let me. Yeah, I, I want to clarify the taxonomy status of the Caetura Bausi, specifically because that there was a wild population from Central America, Central America, but now there are different populations and Caetura is restricted to the Northern Venezuela, but I, I really don't understand that process because Caetura bausi is a migratory migratory bird in North America, but here in Venezuela it's, it's have resident populations. Yeah. So I think uh, Caetura bausi specifically, if I'm not mistaken, it has seven subspecies. So we have bausi bausi, mm -hmm. that's the Caetura that occurs from Alaska up to California and Mexico. I think that's the that's the subspecies that's migratory. Then we have Ketura Vox the rich Monday that occurs in Central America, I think mm -hmm. Costa Rica and Panama. Ketura Vox the Gom Gomeri, that occurs in the Yucatan Peninsula. Ketura Vox the Afanis, I think that's the one that occurs in Venezuela and it has a more restricted um, area. Ketura Vox the Tamaulipensis, that occurs in Mexico and Tamaulip Tamaulipas. Ketura Voxi, um, I, I, I don't remember by heart the, if the other ones of, or which are the other ones, but we have several subspecies. Um, like they, until now, we only have one, one paper that was um, published by Terry Chesser in Collaborators in 2018 that try to do a more like a broad um, phylogeny to understand a little bit more about Keturah in general um, and understand the, 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 if there was a, a subdivision, if, if it's the same species, like if it's Ketur the Keturah from Alaska and the Keturah from uh, Voxy from Alaska and Keturah Voxy from Venezuela, if they are the same. So I, it's, um, it's complicated. I don't think they ain't, they didn't enter in that level of details. We can ask Charles. I think Charles, Charlie just entered in the in the presentation. We can ask him. But when you have like several distinct uh, subspecies of a very broad, like a very large, broad range species, we are finding at least like what I'm discovering in my PhD is that in fact these might be new species. These might be cryptic species. So like the, the Cotura Voxy from Venezuela, it suffers from a problem that's common in Swift that's lack of uh, sampling. We didn't have samples. We just, I just had one single sample from Cotura Voxy Afanis from Venezuela. So ideally, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're, if you want to work with plumage, if you want to work with um, genetics, what do, you, what do you want to work with? But ideally, you would work with morphology and also with other characteristics, especially like genetics that could add, because these swifts, they are very cryptic. So when you're studying like um, complex, like interesting inventories, you have so many different uh, subspecies. When you go deep into the genetics, when you do a molecular analysis, you can see that they are different. The, many of them have a, a divergence, a molecular divergence in the DNA. It's so different between each other 
that they, they sometimes they, some of them are, are we're probably going to consider them different species. They are not the same thing. So I don't know if I answered your question or not. If I gave you like an idea, but like to work with swifts in general, like don't rely only on one in one characteristic, especially morphology. It can be really misleading. I would work with a series of different components. So morphology, um, song or vocalization in Swifts, I don't think that's really relevant, but you can add that. You can try to find like a, a, like a sign, like a evolutionary sign for that. But also you can work with genetic, like with um, molecular, molecular data that that would be probably today's like what would give you what will give you more information for this very cryptic birds thank you renata yeah we have we, we are very interested in this species all the time because it's one of the common species in our bandy station mm -hmm. uh, um, but I, I i read here uh, Tom Ryan say maybe uh, that species is a new species from Venezuela. So thank you so much. We are we are here trying to understand all the time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Renata, for answering the question. Um, I don't know if anyone else uh, has a question. Uh, I'm very interested in the in your findings in Puerto Rico. Um, where have you been uh, like uh, investigating which place in Puerto Rico um, can we find the swifts more? I, I heard that this is uh, the time for them, you know, uh, the, yes. like the reproduction season mm -hmm. or something like that. And it was uh, a place here in El Yunque in Puerto Rico where we can find the species, but I don't know where else in Puerto Rico can we find that um, species of swifts. I was, um, there's a, I don't know, I, I have I have to check the name, like if it's the same name today or not, but there, I, I worked was I worked with a sample from a place called Utuado, and it's a specimen from, um, that's in the American Museum of Natural History. It was collected like in the 20s, 1920s, if I'm not mistaken. But whenever you try to find more information about that, you, you like I, I don't think there were any other works after that like in Puerto Rico trying to find a colony or monitoring any colonies or if ever anybody ever found that this plex with there again in the same site or not but I, I can give you like I can give you the name of the place and maybe we can because in the, that time they didn't have any geographic coordinates so we don't really know if if it well, if the name of the place changed or not, but I can look for it and the exact name and everything and tell you. But apparently, like um, a swift, uh, like the swift, the black swift from the mainland, U.S. Um, and also Central America is something. Swift black swift from Caribbean is another thing. They are they all belong to the same group, like they are sister. Sisters, clades, that's like sister, like subgroups, but they are separated. So I'm still working on that to see the, the difference, like the genetic divergence that they have. We have a threshold value. When you reach a specific value for divergence, we can more or less, it's not only based on that, but that helps us to separate things into like, this is potentially a new species. This is potentially a population that really is very, for many, many millions of years or thousands of years separated from the other population. They, they, don't, they don't mix each other. They don't meet anymore. They have been separated so far that or this, this population is well-established like in the Caribbean. So they are not trying to migrate anywhere they are that in this island so from what i from what i'm seeing today is that the black swift that occurs in the caribbean is something different from the black swift that occurs in north america but they are still sisters the like the same thing but i'm, I'm still like i'm in the final steps 
of checking the level of this separation to see if they, are, they can be considered something different, like different species, or if it's just um, the same species, but different geographic variations of the same thing. Thank you because we also have like black, black swifts in the less lesser antils. Like we have in Puerto Rico, Cuba, um, Jamaica, if I'm not mistaken, in Jamaica, and also like Dominica or Santa Lucia. Mm, I don't really remember right now exactly the, the, the places, but it's very specific, like it's very, very different. And when you look at the birds and in the museum, like when we look at the skin, you can see that they are different. Like the, the birds from the mainland are much larger. They have a different plumage. The birds from the islands, they are different, like physically different. Thank you, Renata, for the information. We hope that you can visit Puerto Rico <laughs> very soon. Yes, I so hope to. Can, yeah, so we can go uh, looking for swifts because I'm determined this year has to be the year when, when, when I can see a, a swift in Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do that visit. <laughs> to <a new> year. <laughs> so thank you so much, Renata, for your time and um, to everyone that participated today uh, with us. Um, if anyone else has uh, like a question or a comment, now is the time. If not, then um, thank you again, Renata. I'm very grateful for your time. Uh, I hope that we can connect at 3 p.m. Puerto Rico and Venezuela time to mm -hmm. listen to Miguel Lentino's um, talk to about mm -hmm. the sweeps. So thank you so much. And if uh, the, anyone like uh, can um, you know, turn on your camera so we can take a picture, I will be very grateful. <laughs> So uh, okay, I'm gonna stop the Facebook live here. Uh, thanks to everyone that I was um, that have been connecting with us uh, through Facebook. So thank you, and we we'll see you at three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stop that. Here.